Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, uh, and thanks for joining us for the, the webinar. Uh, my name is Derek Pass. I'm a major investment specialist and also the uh, state manager for the Northern States and, uh, and WA. Uh, well, there's obviously been a fair bit of volatility around lately, so we thought it'd be a good idea to share our thoughts with you and also uh, uh, answer any questions you may have. You'll probably notice on the, um, uh, on the screen under the GoToWebinar sign, there's a section there where you can type in questions and, uh, and I encourage you, to, uh, encourage you to do so. Okay, so over July, we saw the fund fall by 15%. Uh, index was down about 12%. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to start off by putting that in a bit of um, historical context uh, for the fund as a whole, the fund's performance as a whole. Uh, so hopefully you can see a chart there of the fund since inception in 2005. And I think, uh, well, obviously there has been volatility, but I think it's important to note that a lot of the volatility we have seen historically in the fund has been due to uh, uh, government regulation, uh, government-induced regulation, and the market's response to that. So if we go back to 2011, uh, even 2018, the leveraging campaign by the government caught the market by surprise. Uh, also in 2015, we had the Chinese government tightening up on market lending. Uh, 2016, we had the, um, uh, the widening of the trading, trading ban for the currency. Uh, and then even in 2018, in a more sector specific, uh, at a more sector specific level, we had uh, the government introducing regulation in terms of um, uh, access to gambling uh, in China. Uh, so even though we are uh, it's not uh, it's not without precedent, particularly when it comes to. Uh, uh, government introducing new regulation and uh, also perhaps uh, um, an inability of the government to adequately communicate uh, the change in regulation with uh, with capital markets. So I think it's just um, it's just important to uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the long-term track record for the fund uh, is still good. Um, so 10% per annum net of all freeze. Uh, the index 8.7%. Uh, so I just um, I just like to stress again uh, for those who are joining us, uh, there's a question box there. Please feel free to ask uh, ask as many questions as you like, and we'll do our best to uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, I've also, uh, in the interest of time, I've prepared a few questions as well, just from um, conversations with advisors over the last um, over the last few weeks. Uh, now, at this point, I'd, um, uh, I'd like to introduce our key speaker, uh, Jonathan Wu. Uh, Jonathan is the executive director, uh, as well as the group's chief investment specialist. Jonathan's been an specialist for over 15 years, uh, building the uh, building a bridge of understanding between Australian investors and uh, the opportunities on offer in Asia. Uh, Jonathan and the team published the first Asian investment-centric book for investors back in 2011, uh, and we've distributed about 20,000 copies of that. Uh, Jonathan holds a range of uh, qualifications, including a Bachelor's of Commerce and a Global Executive MBA from the University of Sydney. Uh, he's a CPA with specialist certifications in financial planning and self-managed super funds and he's a FCHFP with the AFA. Jonathan understands uh, and has lived through multiple economic cycles across Asia uh, and we are able to provide a unique depth of understanding uh, to everyone on this call this afternoon. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to put the first question to, uh, to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, can you provide us more detail regarding the recent sell-off in Chinese equities? Sure. Thanks, Derek. Um, <clears throat> so good afternoon, everybody, and, and thanks for joining our call on, uh, on uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, for those who are in Sydney like ourselves, um, I hope you're surviving okay through lockdown. So to give everyone an uh, initial um, context around what we've you know, recently seen in terms of market volatility, um, the key thing is that I want to help set some context um, today. 
Um, and Derek, probably mute yourself uh, now because I think there's a little bit of feedback coming through. Um, so what I want to do is set some context to start things off. And the context by which I want to explain everything um, to everyone today through a lens of social harmony. Um, so we all have known for a number of years now that China's main target is not to uh, target the quantity of growth, but it is pretty much to look at the quality of growth um, longer term in order to achieve that social harmony. Now, the latest round of sell-offs uh, were linked to the changes announced by the government, in, at least in draft form, around the after-school tutoring sector. Now, what we need to remember is that the changes that have been announced is focused around the K-9 curriculum. So then the question is, what's the big deal? Is a material impact to Chinese GDP that the Chinese government has to actively target it and try to regulate and control the sector? Um, no, not from a GDP for perspective, from a cultural perspective. The problem has been with after-school tutoring is that um, effectively, if you had the means to put your children through after-school tutoring, and the reason for that is a lot of Asian parents across the whole of Asia, and this is not specifically uh, only China, if they want to see um, their children do better and have the opportunities that they did not have because they didn't have such a strong background in education or level of education, after school tutoring is the way to go. That's the sort of the mindset that's in Asian families, that we put ch children through after school tutoring, they'll get better grades, they'll have better opportunities in the future. To provide a very, very stark example of this, um, to help everyone on the call understand what's happening, is that in Hong Kong, a place like Hong Kong, very capitalistic in nature, um, Kids have to go through examinations to get into kindergarten, okay? This is something that's effectively unheard of in Western society, okay? But that is how much pressure kids are under in Asia, and therefore after-school tutoring creates that extra opportunity. But the problem is after-school tutoring is incredibly expensive. So if you don't have the means to do that, you can't put your kids through after-school tutoring, and therefore you can't put, give them a leg up, so to speak. And so this is the reason why the government has targeted this sector this time round. We completely agree with the market consensus, and this is not only this cycle, but the previous cycles of government announcements on policy and regulation, that the Chinese government lacks tact in terms of um, uh, how it's being communicated. Okay? And policy is not communicated particularly well um, whenever the government wants to hit a particular sector. Now, if we translate that into the stock market, probably now there's a company that's become a household name is TAL or TAL Education, nothing to do with TAL as an insurance company. And this company is listed in the United States. Its share price in the last 12 months has fallen 92%. Okay, and obviously most of that is on the back of what's happened in the last uh, two to three weeks. Now, to be clear, um, none of our portfolios hold uh, any exposure whatsoever historically or now in the after school tutoring sector and we have less than one percent exposure in tertiary education of which tertiary education meaning university TAFE and above is not subject to the current set of regulations um, and that's very very different to after school tutoring uh, in this in this in this particular context what's also happened um, that has sort of exacerbated the level of selling in the market uh, is the margin lending deleveraging uh, is a flow and effect of the market falling. But what has been different this time round compared to previous, uh, I guess, cycles is that the panic selling from our capital flow data has been showing it's more global or offshore investors, meaning investors like in Australia or in Canada or US or in Europe are the ones that are selling out of these stocks and not the domestic players or the other Asian investors. Um, and I think this is purely a context of understanding the market overall. Um, so that's what's been happening recently. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jonathan. So that's the uh, the after school uh, sector. Uh, could you also share your thoughts on uh, on other areas of increased regulation as well? Yeah. So if we consider the other sectors um, that have been, you know, the subject of um, target targeting by, by by government regulatory bodies um, in the last couple of of months, and I guess the last quarter, um, it is again 
circulating around the concept of social harmony. So social harmony defined by the Chinese government, and this was sort of reiterated or reinforced at the recent 100 year centenary of the Chinese Communist Party celebrations, that the quality of people. So really continuing down the path of effective social, uh, socialism compared to uh, capitalism, which has been sort of the cornerstone policy framework of his government since the opening um, around uh, 40 years ago. Now, um, if you consider the three biggest burdens to a Chinese household, and this is where the government policy has been targeted, something that, that we've talked about before um, over history, uh, is the following sectors. One is education, two is property and the cost of living, and three is around healthcare. So one of the things um, uh, to talk through is that the current regulatory cycle that we're in happens once every three years or so. Um, and what happens uh, uh, sort of once every three years, uh, and the most recent one to bring to, to bring to focus to everyone was back in 2017, uh, we saw the internet gaming sector get hit. And predominantly this was targeted around Tencent. So we had children, being addicted to games on mobile phones, tablets, and computers, um, and a number of them died, and a number of them actually also committed suicide. So this becomes a social problem in China, uh, and the government attacked the sector. They put in regulations, and so what was Tencent's response? Tencent's response was they put in new compliance measures, they put in things like age verification, uh, gaming limits for children, and the sector has continued to thrive. And that is why Tencent has uh, been a top holding of the Prime China as well as Prime Asia funds for a significant period of time. Um, if we also then go back a bit further into history and look at something like, say, in 2013, uh, we saw when President Xi first came to power, he had a very, very aggressive anti-corruption campaign. Now, that anti-corruption campaign uh, ended up locking up 20,000 officials uh, for bribery and corruption and so on and so forth. And indirectly, one of the biggest sectors that was hit was Chinese white liquor. Now I'm referring to Chinese vodka here, not referring to uh, Chardonnay. So this is the very high end liquor that a lot of officials were using to bribe people. And a lot of business people were using to bribe um, uh, corrupt officials. And one of the offsets of that is if you remove that as a market, um, these companies have suffered immediately a 30 to 40% drop in their overall, over, overall revenue. Now, the reality is they adapted, they changed their business model. So think about Johnny Walker uh, only offering one label. They then moved to offering six or seven different labels, targeting different price points. Uh, and these different price points obviously then allowed um, the, the sector to flourish again. And in actual fact, Mao Tai is also a top 10 holding of the fund. So these are two simple examples of regulatory cycles we've seen in the past. Remember that it doesn't destroy a sector. The government is not trying to destroy sectors. They're trying to regulate sectors uh, in order to achieve social harmony, okay? And if they don't deal with the issues around property, if they don't deal with issues around healthcare and the aging population and demographics, um, as well as education, they're not going to be able to uh, deal with their longer term issues. And but this, you know, the aging demographic problem is, is one thing that's that's quite global in nature. So if we look at that, if we consider again the education part of it, because after school tutoring cost is costing so much, the Chinese government realized that people aren't going to have as many children. If you don't have as many children, then the aging population problem and the funding of the pension system is only going to get worse, which is what we're seeing in most Western democracies. Then if we also look at uh, the other part of the IT sector, it's around data protection and privacy. And most recently, Didi, or the Chinese equivalent of Uber, has been the one that has been subject of, uh, of a lot of regulation. Again, this is not dissimilar at all to the Europeans' uh, GDR, the GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation that came in about five years ago, which leads to us nowadays going onto websites and being forced to click accept all cookies. Um, and these things will continue to happen. Um, then there's the gig economy. Uh, we would have seen in Australia that there's been some landmark cases around Uber drivers and Uber Eats drivers taking the company to task to the courts and saying, we need more benefits, we need to be paid more. Same thing's happening in China, but the government's taking the front foot 
in trying to regulate these companies to increase the wages of these people in the gig economy so that they can actually achieve a living wage and again reduce the pressures of those three sectors that I just talked about. And then overall in the tech sector, which is different to China Internet, is this whole issue around anti-monopolistic behavior. So anti-monopolistic behavior is primarily targeting exclusive distribution agreements that Alibaba has had in place uh, for a number of years. So if you're a Nike or an Adidas and you're trying to sell your product into China, you might list your product on Tmall. So Tmall is the upper end branding um, uh, sort of e-commerce site for Alibaba and your distribution agreement said you can't actually sell anywhere else. So the Chinese government has hit back on that um, and basically is trying to put in antitrust laws to increase innovation and increase uh, competition. We have no exposure in Alibaba and we actually sold out of exposure late last year and something we're going to come back to uh, uh, later on. But in Tencent's situation, they are impacted by the antitrust regulations in the sense that they are holding ex exclusive track distribution rights in one of their business arms called Tencent Music. The reality though is that Tencent Music is a very, very small um, uh, uh, part of Tencent's business. And when we've done the recent valuations and adjustments to our modeling, even if we take into account the fines that they have to pay on the back of um, these new regulations that are coming to force, the earnings of the overall Tencent group will be able to pay it over and over on top again. It's no different to the banks in Australia being hit with massive fines by APRA, but their earnings will make it up you know, very, very quickly uh, within the next 12 months. So Tencent, even though it's still a, a, a top holding of our portfolios, we are quite comfortable where they sit at the moment. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jonathan. And um, so obviously some, uh, some headwinds to negotiate. Do you see any tailwinds? Yeah, so with any regulation um, that we've seen in past cycles, we certainly feel that there's tailwinds that are um, very, you know, uh, impacting some particular sectors. And this is probably where it, where it sort of draws in um, the conversation around how we are currently positioning portfolios, um, which is why a lot of you are on the call because um, uh, of your support of our funds. And we certainly thank you very much uh, for the support. Many of you have been supporting us for over 15 years. Um, so the way that I want to talk about where we stand with regards to our portfolio is that we'll split into sort of and dissect it into three parts. We've got the tech side, which still is a, a material part of our portfolio. Uh, even with the new regulations that have come into play, um, we feel that the sector or the structural tailwind of the overall sector, which is moving to more e-commerce, moving to digital platforms, and also the consumption of a lot of services via um, digital platforms is only going to continue to grow. And when we look at the structural growth of the market as a whole, despite regulation, um, that sec the sector is still very, very attractive in terms of growth profile compared to a lot of traditional sectors like say property or even banking. Um, and so in the tech space, we have trimmed slightly our positions in Tencent as well as Meituan. Um, and then we have uh, and this is something that we did probably earlier in the year rather than now, is that we actually substituted Alibaba because we exited our Alibaba position and went into Pinduoduo. Um, and Pinduoduo is effectively a direct competitor to Alibaba. And it is a very strong competitor and will be even stronger with the antitrust uh, regulations coming into force. Um, and it's only going to benefit them going forward because there's going to be so many more um, people and vendors that will be able to sell their goods in China and increase their market penetration by um, effectively not having to choose one distribution path uh, going forward. Then the second part, um, sorry, there's one more comment I want to make on the, on the China internet sector. Um, the valuation as it stands at the moment, the, the, the China internet sector hit a peak valuation of 40 times in late February uh, and now it's trading around 24 to 25 times. If we look back at history and we consider when the last time um, the sector was under attack being Tencent Gaming um, back in 2017, the whole sector corrected to around 24 times. So if history is any good guide, um, we're pretty much close to, to close to the trough. Now, what's interesting for us in terms of our modeling going forward with these companies though, is how the increased regulation will add to their cost base. 
we are no longer focusing so much on top line revenue growth because structurally we know that, that they're there. Okay, and even though Tencent through its subsidiary WeChat has suspended new 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 um, account openings um, in recent weeks, uh, pending new regulations that are about to come through. Um, none of this changes the overall structure of growth story that I was talking about. Um, so the sector overall still remains uh, attractive to us long term and we're finding different um, points in time for us to enter. The second part of our portfolio now is around localization and localization effectively refers to bringing uh, supply chains for Chinese manufacturers in the delivery of both goods and services, uh, bringing them onshore, um, as opposed to outsourcing it onto different countries. And the third part is around recovery plays. And I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about recovery plays. Um, the recovery plays um, are targeting companies that are potentially not subject to regulation, or in actual fact, the vice versa is subject to government incentives uh, to be innovative and effectively increase their ability to compete. So to give you a live example, in the last month, we've added to two companies in the portfolio that are now starting to increase their exposures. That is a company called Merida and a company called Giant. Now, you may not have heard of Merida, but you would have heard of Giant in the context of uh, bicycles, so pedal bicycles. Now, obviously, these companies are innovating. They're going down the track of e-bicycles, electric bikes, so on and so forth. Um, and not subject to government regulations, not an area that the government's actually got any concern around. And because of the strength of e-commerce uh, since COVID started, obviously we've seen um, an increase in sales globally for these two companies. And again, the structural tailwinds that they're gonna see through um, is going to also be quite strong. Another example of a completely unrelated sector uh, with regards to um, the recovery pay, the recovery play, sorry, is shipping companies. So the context is we entered the shipping um, sector in November 2020. Now, uh, because of COVID, uh, a lot of shipping companies have had to shut down their operations. Uh, and we all know China was first in, first out of the crisis. Even though there are certain parts, back to Wuhan, southern China and Guangdong, they're currently under lockdowns and, are, and now doing rapid testing for its population to basically stamp out. Um, very similar strategy to Australia, a suppression to zero strategy on Delta variant, um, is that China's shipping companies have been be able to reoperate and reopen uh, for a very extended period of time. Um, and if we look at the costs of shipping a container uh, in pre-COVID times from the port of Shanghai to the port of LA, it will cost around 2000 US dollars. Uh, earlier this year, cost 10,000 US dollars. So five times what it costs in pre-COVID times. So the question is, why is that? Well, again, it's supply and demand. What that is so powerful about our investment team in the whole of Asia is that we also leverage off big data sources. And one of those big data sources that's directly linked to the shipping industry is around traffic volume. So traffic volumes allow us to effectively measure where the traffic is going, where is it originating from, and trying to see if there are nuances and companies that are currently being undervalued by the market, which is again, our investment philosophy. It's not growth, it's not value. We are looking for quality value or quality growth, okay? Um, so we started putting um, portfolio allocations in this space um, in late last year. Uh, and what's been, what we found was very interesting, going back to our, 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 uh, the power of our research, is that there was effectively no sell-side research for shipping companies in China. Uh, and what was then more interesting is that in February and March, three months after we started allocating to the sector, there were about three to four sell-side analysts that were starting to pick up the theme, because they also realized that there's an anomaly in the market whereby shipping costs have gone through the roof. So we've made very, very good money on the shipping sector. Um, which is reflected in our portfolio returns year to date. What we're currently looking for is the exit point. Um, the exit point for us has always been critical. We don't want to overpay for things. We want to find the right timing if we think that there's tailwinds that will particularly come up or the stock has run ahead of its own pace. Um, usually, we probably should get up around now. Uh, and the rationale for that is the global peak traffic for shipping is around August each year. And August, um, uh, 
is the key uh, month because effectively most Western countries are trying to get their shipments in by Christmas and the holiday season. Uh, but right now we still see anomal uh, an anomaly in terms of the pricing given it's 10,000 US dollars uh, per container, but it's something that we're looking very closely at and trying to find an exit. So that's the, probably a very interesting way of looking at, looking at our portfolio through those three lenses. One's the recovery play, one is the localization, uh, and one is talking about the um, uh, talking about the, the the sort of tech sectors, which are probably under a little bit of pressure. Now, if I, now obviously that leads to a question around has um, has the um, impact of the market overall impacted our returns? Um, now, what you see on the screen right now is the performance of the premium Asia fund um, since its history back in 2009, and this is a, a, a a table and a chart that we keep updating because we get a lot of this exact same question around how have we performed in through our long-term history against Platinum, who was effectively the incumbent. Um, and what you can see here is that we've sort of broken it down on a calendar year basis. Um, we are effectively offering uh, advisors and investors on the call a very attractive entry point um, into this space with a manager that historically uh, actually uh, a more expensive product um, because we had our fees set at 178 basis points plus a performance fee prior to July 2019 and now it's actually reduced all the way down to 133 basis point with no performance fee and you can see our performance against the incumbent uh, year on year and this being a recovery year um, and also a very volatile year of even you know that sort of growth uh, switching into value based on the inflation fears we saw in sort of February um, our fund has still performed uh, in, in July, um, 700 odd basis points net of fees, um, which we're very, very proud of in terms of our overall ability to keep performing. Um, then on top of that, um, what we've been able to do over time is that we've been able to sort of show our worth um, and our capability by sort of measuring how much risk do we fundamentally take on to achieve the performance that you're seeing up on the screen. Um, now, obviously, the sharp ratios and information ratios are effectively measuring one versus our peers and one versus a, a, a risk, sorry, a, a benchmark, um, effectively looking at are we taking on excessive risk to achieve excessive performance uh, over risk-free rate and then over the, um, over the, uh, the benchmark. And what's very pleasing to see is that obviously the higher the number, the better. You can see our performance over all time periods is that we beat our peer median. Uh, and then on top of that, with, with regards to the information ratio piece, you can see that it is very difficult to invest in Asia well. Um, and that's exacerbated by the fact that you can see on the five and seven year basis, the average manager available in Australia that invests in Asia um, actually underperformed the benchmark, um, which is how you interpret a negative peer median figure uh, for the information ratio. So it's very, very critical that when you're looking at Asia, you need to find someone specialized uh, in this space. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jonathan. And uh, just, just a reminder, everyone who's listening in, if you do have any questions, please uh, please feel free to type them, uh, type them in. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned the, uh, the localization process going on at China, in China at the moment. Could you um, Could you expand on that a bit more? So the localization um, theme, which is the second out of the three um, sort of themes that are sort of uh, culminating or floating through our portfolio, um, localization refers to, as I said, the localization of supply chains. Um, the key rationale for this is China is under ongoing aggression from the United States, left, right and center. And today there was an announcement of the US offering something similar um, to what um, what the UK was offering last year for Hong Kong citizens to leave. Um, you know, a lot of these, you know, we're not commenting on because it's really irrelevant to our investment process. Um, but it is, again, just another reflection of the ongoing aggression. Last year, we saw effectively um, uh, Donald Trump asking and forcing Chinese companies to, uh, you know, go away um, and no longer list in the United States, forcing a lot of US institutional investors not being able to invest in Chinese companies uh, through the exclusion lists that, that appeared at the end of last year. 
Um, and that was very, very interesting to watch. So, so the Chinese government responds to that, and especially the CSRC, which is the equivalent of ASIC um, in China, um, has basically encouraged companies, hey, come home, there's a lot to choose from. You can list on the A market, you can list in Hong Kong, you can list on the new star board, which a lot of tech companies list on. Um, it's a really, really strong market with a lot of depth. Um, so if we look at sort of upstream sectors um, and where we found sort of opportunities uh, is, is within the semiconductor space. Now, a lot of people on this call probably have already heard about semiconductors, you know, talks, you know, within an inch of its life and everyone talks about TSMC. That's true. Um, and we still have a very strong holding in TSMC as well as Samsung Electronics, which are the two key manufacturers um, that have the global lead in manufacturing very, very high tech precision um, semiconductors down to the size of seven nanometers. But the reality is, is that not every electronic good in the world needs a seven nanometer um, uh, semiconductor. And China actually mass produces 28 nanometer semiconductors very, very well and very, very consistently with a very, very high quality. Um, and so these, uh, a lot of the fridges or dryers or other consumer electronics that you have that don't require seven nanometer use 28 nanometer. It brings down costs, increased scale. Um, and so we are looking at those sort of companies within the supply chain um, that has the ability to be able to thrive uh, as China continues to effectively localize um, its supply chains and reduce the reliance on overseas groups um, as less as possible. Then the other sort of sleeve with regards to localization is around local brands. Um, and local brands is a very, very important uh, thing to China. And if, for those of you who have sort of been to China and I've taken a number of you on the call today to China over the last sort of 15 years, um, the development of local brands has been critical to the Chinese identity. And on being very, very anti-China, um, the Chinese population and the populace has effectively come together um, in a very strong way um, and have basically uh, come together and say, we will support local brands. Um, the Chinese term for this concept is called Guo Chao, um, or in Cantonese is Guo Tiu. And effectively what that relates to in loose terms is that the support of local brands representing local identity. So what we've seen when we're looking at, uh, when we look at consumer big data, when we look at consumption patterns between older generations and younger generations, the younger generations overwhelmingly prefer to buy Chinese local brands. So the way that we're accessing that, which we can't see many managers actually uh, considering this space, is Anta Sports as well as in the leaning. Le leaning is probably your biggest comparative point to Nike in the United States, um, and it's a global brand name. And so is Anta. Uh, uh, so is Anta Sports. So both of these groups are trading at very, very attractive valuations for us, and hence we've got an allocation in that space. And these brands structurally also face a lot of tailwinds, uh, a lot of tailwinds going forward. And so these are sort of two ways to look at localization and how we're sort of strategically positioning our portfolios in that way. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, so I found in conversation with the advisors uh, uh, question for a Aussie based uh, fund managers either limiting their exposure to Chinese stocks or in fact selling out of them entirely. Uh, have you got any views on that? So in one word, I would say that we're quite perplexed. Um, we're quite perplexed um, with regards to the way that um, uh, people have, have actually withdrawn their allocations to, to China. And what I said earlier is that when we looked at the capital flow data for the last couple of weeks, it's actually been offshore managers selling out of Chinese stocks, not onshore managers. And that's been very interesting um, because I think onshore managers do understand the context of the regulatory regime. Um, they understand the culture better, obviously. Um, and sort of, we, we're sort of sitting in that same camp. We think that's been overplayed. We've seen these cycles happen before with regulatory pressure as exemplified by the examples I gave earlier uh, on the call. Um, and for us, there's always good opportunity. Um, government regulation is, something that every country goes through. The United States has got plenty of regulatory risk. Um, Australia has plenty of regulatory risk, um, but there's always the ability to pivot. 
Um, when managers say that we're out of China because of regulatory risk or we're structurally reducing our exposure to China due to regulatory risk, um, it simply reflects the depth of knowledge and what we believe is the depth of research. Um, and we don't criticize those managers directly, but you can't be good at everywhere. Um, we have never been in the last 15 years um, sitting here and saying we're good at US equities. We have no idea. Um, we have no idea about European equities or Australian equities. We specialize in what we specialize in, which is Asian equities. Um, and we understand the nuances, the culture, the way the market cycle moves year in, year out. Um, and that's why for the premium Asia fund for the last sort of 11 years track record we've run, we've done over 12% uh, net, uh, net of fees return, which is 300 basis points per annum above the benchmark um, and significantly stronger against our peers. So we do find it perplexing that managers have, have taken the stance and that's fine. Um, but I think it, it certainly brings home the point of A, local knowledge is critical uh, and B, if you're a passive investor in China uh, and you're following the benchmark to invest, you, you are looking down the barrel of some significant risks um, in a place like China where regulatory risk is rife. The only difference I would say is that the way that the regulatory risk is sort of, um, uh, sort of implemented is very, very different. Um, so the sort of same thing can be said uh, around, around debt as well, um, because a lot of people sort of uh, talk about um, our debt piece. Um, and what we see is that, you know, we've got a 10, over a 10 year track record uh, with regards to running uh, Asian debt. Uh, and on the back of that, you can see that our performance, and this is historical, um, the historical, the historical, sorry, I just realized I'm not actually showing my screen. Um, um, the historical nature of, of our performance in an in environment where interest rates were fundamentally higher um, going forward is a real struggle. Um, and the struggle for everyone going forward when looking at active versus passive is how do you add value to your clients? Because I think the fee situation is less important um, because we're, what we're saying is through active management, even in the debt space, um, Asian corporate bonds gives us over 700 basis points of active yield. And we're not looking down the barrel of negative uh, capital growth or capital loss by holding those set of bonds. So for those people on the call um, uh, uh, that understand the fundamental problem with investing in bonds or any part of the fixed interest market at the moment is the risk of capital loss. So if you're holding on to Australian or international government bonds on an index basis, um, you are basically telling your clients that I, I will guarantee your capital loss going forward and it's something that you have to wear. And that's something that we're very, very mindful of um uh, uh very very mindful of with regards to the way that we're sort of structuring portfolios um going forward both on the equity as well as the debt side and by the way we will circulate these couple of slides um for everyone after the call as well thanks uh jonathan uh, stock specific question uh, uh, do you still see upside in leaning uh, given the current valuations? Yeah, um, for a lot of the consumer space at the moment, um, because of the broad based sell off in equities, uh, a lot of these names are attractive. So I did allude to before, both Anta Sports and Leaning are very attractive uh, to us. Um, again, structural tailwinds uh, powering the middle class and the government effectively ensuring um, that the middle class growth. Uh, continues to be there on the back of ensuring affordable education, affordable healthcare, and affordable property and living space. Um, so both Leaning and Anta are on very attractive basis for us at the moment, especially given global managers have exited some of those positions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, what percentage of the premium China fund is invested via offshore markets and are not China shares? So uh, the majority of our exposure has historically been on offshore markets. So if, if you're defining offshore as non A shares, which includes Hong Kong, obviously Taiwan, um, even the B market, um, we currently hold around 15% or so in A shares, and the rest of it is all non A shares. That answers your question. Okay, that's great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, just, uh, just a reminder: if you've got any questions, please uh, uh, feel free to uh, to type away.
we, we do understand that there have been a number of um, a number of these webinars that have come out from various managers in the last couple of weeks. I guess what we've tried to do today, which has um, hopefully been different and unique, is around um, providing a bit more context on the ground, uh, because I think that's critical to understanding that investing in China is not easy, and it hasn't been easy for 15 years, and it won't be easy over the next few especially if you don't have uh, local on the ground presence. Uh, and it's something that we've held on very, very strongly, even within our own advice practice, is that if someone was to show us a best of breed, um, best of breed Indian manager, we'd jump at it. Or if there was a best of breed South African manager, we'd jump at it. It is very, very fundamentally difficult for a equities manager to be good at everything and everywhere. Uh, in the same way of why we have local expertise in Australian equities and we're only sort of two, three percent of the globe, um, we have such a plethora of managers and we don't outsource Australian equities to a global manager is because we believe in local expertise. So in the same way, when you are considering your asset allocation to regions, uh, especially in Asia, you have to find someone with the local expertise. And even within Asia, which is why we've got teams based across Malaysia, Singapore, China and the mainland of China is because we have to understand all those different nuances. So our head of Korea is Korean. And then we've got two other analysts below them that are Korean. So the three of them put together, look after the Korean market for us and so on and so forth. So this is where we differ and why we have 70 people at our investment team. Because a lot of people say you've got to be nuts to running 70 people in your investment team. Well, no, we don't. Um, we certainly don't feel that way because you need that sort of manpower um, because you rely on fundamental research. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very true. And also important to keep in mind as well, the markets where we're operating, particularly somewhere like China, is uh, is essentially an inefficient market in that not all the information is in the share price. And uh, and that's where you find that uh, in these inefficient markets, that's where active managers can, uh, can consistently outperform the index. Is there any other questions, Derek? Um, looks like there's a few more coming through now, actually. Uh, is China's level of debt a concern to you? Does this present a headwind to investing in China going forward? So I think the question was, sorry, I didn't quite clear here. It's around China's level of debt and the concern. Yes. Is China's level of debt a concern to you? Does this present a headwind to investing in China going forward? So I think debt's a very interesting um, topic. Um, and the reason is uh, the, the overall macro comment that I'll make around debt is Every economy is printing money. Um, every major economy is printing money, including ours. Uh, and effectively, most central banks' stance on, on this matter is as long as we don't print money as fast as the United States, we're not deflating our currency, or sorry, we're not devaluing our currency um, too badly. What's been interesting is China is the only uh, developed major economy in the world where the central bank has actually been more hawkish since COVID. Um, and that's been very, very interesting and also reflected in um, the government bond interest rate. So if you buy a 10-year government bond in China, China at the moment, you're getting paid about 3%. Um, so it's been very, very interesting um, sort of seeing this and why in the last uh, sort of 12 to 18 months, sort of since COVID has come around, there's been over 120 billion US dollars of fresh money buying onshore Chinese debt. A space that we actually don't invest in, even for our, uh, for our um, income fund. Um, and, but the area is looking more and more attractive to us as more investors um, go into it um, and uh, go into it and actually look to, to have more positioning. What I think has also been interesting uh, with regards to looking at markets is that I have recently, we, we came out with a market piece last week, sort of talking about this topic and then following up with today's webinar. And one of um, a good client of mine in New Zealand sent me an email and said, hey, Jonathan, didn't you tell me that, you know, you've been telling me for years that 
as more and more foreign investors uh, go into uh, China and invest into China, the overall level of volatility will drop because the retail market domestically in China has been driven, uh, has been driving uh, a market level activity to look something like a casino. Yes, that's correct. And I still stand by that. Um, the problem is people are still trying to get comfortable with the concept of investing in China, which is why we've seen the capital outflows um, have been from offshore managers. Um, that's something I actually didn't expect. I expected that offshore managers would slowly understand more about China and the regulatory environment and actually be long-term investors. So we've seen the actually opposite happen where um, foreign or offshore uh, managers have been the ones that have been driving the level of volatility. So that's been very interesting. Great, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Uh, another question, where do you see chip manufacturing trajectory within China? Yeah, um, so chip manufacturing in China will become more and more advanced. Um, there's still quite a way off to get to seven nanometers, which I alluded to when I was talking about TSMC and Samsung Electronics. Um, we believe, based on our modeling, that TSMC and Samsung have still got about three years of competitive advantage ahead of them before other players will be able to challenge them in, in this space or get close to, to them. And remember that um, TSMC and, and, and uh, Samsung aren't just sitting around doing nothing. Um, they're going out and designing the five nanometer chip, which will then be followed up by a three nanometer chip. Um, so these guys aren't sitting on the laurels and just, just basically um, you know, uh, celebrating on yesterday's success. Um, so China has a way to catch up, but again, I allude to the fact that the market is not only about seven, eight, seven, five, or even three nanometer chips. It's about um, you know broad-based application, um, and China, given the fact that it's slowly, well, it already really has moved up the value chain overall. What we've been able to see and come out of the back of that is that China has been able to replace the labor-intensive manufacturing with high-end, high-margin. Um, manufacturing technologies and that's been very very good to see um, but you know, they're not necessarily going to challenge uh, those two incumbents just yet. Okay uh, there's a um, uh, question from Richard uh, do you see more headwinds and regulatory changes that will affect Chinese companies listed and or seeking listing on offshore markets, especially US capital markets? The short answer is yes. Um, the US is not letting up uh, on its pressure. Um, since Donald Trump, well, there were some people that were saying that uh, with a Biden administration, we'd see a, um, a watering down of its aggression against China. Yes. That is true to the extent of the the type of rhetoric that comes out. We don't have a we're not we're not um, looking at markets based on someone's Twitter feed. Um, but probably the one way to exemplify that the U.S. is still structurally in a position where they need to continue to be aggressive towards China um, is around the fact that one of the last pieces of legislation uh, the previous president or President Trump uh, implemented was the exclusion list, which started off with a list of companies that U.S. Um, corporates and, and investors can't invest in, that has been updated twice by the Biden administration. Now, that hasn't been updated with reducing the number of companies, um, but that has been actually updated with um, increasing the number of companies on that list. So yes, the capital markets and the future of Chinese companies continuing to have and have a very welcome approach in listing in China. Um, that window is, is, is closing, which is why the CSRC has been very, very um, much on the front foot in saying to companies, hey, there's a lot of opportunity in, in actually listing in China. Um, it's closer to home um, and you're going to get less regulatory pressure. Hey, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Uh, topical uh, question from Alice there. Uh, there's a lot of politics going on in Australia and uh, surely there's uh, more influence on being on the inside rather than exiting. What is the reality with the business community versus the politicians? Al, I had a feeling you were going to ask me a question like this. Um, 
I mean, we don't, we don't, we try to stay away from the, from the pure politics of it. I mean, if the government comes out with a policy, um, then so be it. Uh, doesn't really impact our actual ability to invest, and uh, I, I reiterate that again. Um, the reality is, is that the business community, if we look at the Australian context of it, whether you're a coal explorer or a wine grower uh, and a wine, you know, uh, seller maker, uh, feeling it and you're feeling it really, really tough at the moment. Um, and we certainly understand that context. Um, China overall, its middle class continues to grow. Um, it's a market that I think everyone wants to get into, regardless of the political environment. Um, and it's really a matter for the politicians to work out what is the best way to create a cooperative working environment with China. Whether or not um, you, you know, fundamentally agree from a cultural perspective. Um, I, I, can't, I, I can't remember exactly now who said the following, uh, but a very, very smart uh, gentleman said this before. Um, is that you don't fundamentally have to agree on cultural norms and what is acceptable cultural or societal practice um, in order to have a fruitful trading relationship. And the best way to exemplify that is the trading relationship that China has with Japan. I mean, you think about the number of gripes that China has with Japan historically, right? The World War II ramifications. They have a great trading relationship. They have a terrible political relationship though, right? They're arguing about Daoyu Islands and all those sort of things, but they fundamentally know how to separate those two issues. Um, and if you can separate those two issues, you'll have a thriving relationship. Uh, and you know, this is a personal thing, not so much our fund managers. I think that if politicians can look at things from that context, I think it will be more fruitful. Uh, unfortunately, what I would say is uh, China through its policy implementation in the last couple of years, we've certainly seen that the reality for, for them has been um, the ability for them to domesticify, if I, I think I made that, that word, um, their supply chains, the better it is for them going forward. Um, and it means that the overall Chinese economy wouldn't be held to ransom um, by anybody else. And, and I guess the other point to raise here is one of the great things about China, whether or not you agree with their style of government, which is authoritarian and now moving to implemented socialism, um, is they can always take the best parts of Western democracy and implement it in their economy. And never let the cultural impact um, uh, the cultural nuances that you may disagree with impact uh, your trading relationships because both can still greatly benefit in an environment um, where we're sort of unfortunately going back in terms of globalization. Um, and you know what? That could well be the final trigger of where we see inflation because it's not coming anywhere else in re any real means that a central bank is willing to accept, um, but it might come in the form of deglobalization. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Jonathan. Uh, two, part, um, two part question uh, from Richard. Uh, would there be a considered move to increase the education to Chinese tech companies by A shares? Uh, and also, uh, what are your views on the reporting transparencies and governance associated with Chinese capital markets? Um, thanks for that question. It's 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 an interesting one. Um, yes, would be the, the the considered answer. I mean, we don't necessarily prefer which market we access tech stocks. It could be China A. Um, it could be H. Um, there are also circumstances by which uh, Derek, could you go on mute again, please? Um, if if a company dualists, uh, we've also seen the ability to arbitrage. Um, so if we sort of go back five years in sort of another sector um, being property, a lot of Chinese property companies were actually listed on the B market, then subsequently dual listed themselves on the H. And what we do is we'd arbitrage the prices to generate a return because it's like I've been BHP between Australia and London. Um, 
And so, you know, it, the considered move, as per your question, is really all about valuations um, as opposed to capital markets. Uh, one thing that has come into contention recently um, that will be interesting to see how it plays out is this concept of uh, variable interest entities in China. Um, so there's this sort of structure called VIEs where a lot of Chinese tech companies have decided to list or create variable interest entities, which effectively, um, in short, uh, shift the control uh, away from shareholders um, and reduce the risks of reporting and disclosures and whatnot. Um, and that was one path some of these after-school tutoring companies were going uh, through. Um, and so a question came up recently to us from one of our institutional clients, um, whether or not VIEs have any future, um, because that was a considered way of people, of, of companies listing um, in a lower risk to the company per se. Um, the CSRC or the equivalent of ASIC in China did come out um, post this latest round of corrections and did say that VIEs are still a viable way of companies to list if it's appropriate for their industry or their structure. So they haven't provided, um, they haven't said no for sure. Um, and we still think it is a viable way, but we certainly see that there is some regulatory risk in that space. And if tech companies are using a VIE structure to list, yes, we are doubly careful um, as to whether or not we are interested in, 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 um, in investing in those companies, because there are some disclosure anomalies is probably the way to put it. Um, and if we are concerned about that, then obviously there's some transparency issues that we would try to tend to avoid. Again, only active managers can do this. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. And uh, it's really coming to the end of the question. So, if anyone's got any, got any more questions, now's, uh, now's the time to ask. So, just to also reinforce all the strategies we have in the market, the China Fund, the Asia, as well as Asia Income, is all well covered by research houses. So, um, feel free to reach out or go on our website um, to have a look at the, the research houses that have been back your recommendations. Um, but yeah, over to you, Derek. Yeah, okay. well, we'll, um, we'll wrap things up there, but uh, thanks everyone. Thanks, Jonathan, and thanks everyone for, uh, for dialing in. And uh, if you do have any follow up questions, please feel free to get in touch with uh, either myself or, uh, or Jonathan. And uh, stay safe and have a good weekend. Thank you.